<laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about bridging machine learning optimization. Um, it's great to present to JumpDev because most people know more than me about everything that I'm going to talk about, so it's going to be very easy. And I'm going to skip a lot of stuff because I think Pascal is going to talk about a bunch of these things in ISMP. So also make my life easier. Um, so a few of the things I'm going to talk about, relationship, machine learning, and optimization, um, how I have used in jump and uh, machine learning to train, like helping train uh, machine learning models using jump. It's great when things work. Uh, Julius, uh, multiple dispatch helps things make everything easy. And jump and reinforcement learning, how I have solved reinforcement learning problems, sequential problems with the help of jump as well, and perhaps a few words for the future. All right, so machine learning, we have seen many great applications, but they have been mostly in uh, descriptive and prescriptive uh, pre predictive problems, right? So we describe the world, we estimate uncertainties, and uh, we allow people to make decisions afterwards uh, using those uh, descriptions. While in optimization, we focused a lot on prescriptions and actions, and we have had great success in each one of those applications very separately. Although uh, machine learning has a branch of machine learning, reinforcement learning has done uh, trying to learn the optimal actions um, and had had many failures, but then great success um, in some few applications later on. And optimization for a long time used uh, more or less simplistic ways to describe the world, the uncertainties through uh, scenarios or uh, an estimation of your uncertainty, right? And robust. Um, but we do have some history together and we can use machine learning to kind of do some predictions about the uncertainties, estimations of uh, the probabilities of certain scenarios or estimation of even ambiguity sets, and then we can feed that as an input to an optimization problem and allow our solvers to solve that. And at my previous company, we had uh, done that in a very more or less successful way. Uh, we built this very complicated portfolio optimization problems for our investments, and then we could use machine learning to do some forecast um, and use as inputs, as I have described previously. And if you want to have a look at a little bit of a taste of that, I have a personal package, which is an extension of Jump, and where you can kind of see that bridging there. But it's very bad code, so don't judge. Um, predict, but we could also, bef also not only connect machine learning to optimization, we can loop that back in, and that's something we also did, so that we can train our machine learning models with an application-driven um, objective function. So we have to kind of, if we want to use the, the actual um, returns, for example, in the investment problem that we get in practice and we want to propagate that back to our machine learning models, we need to be able to differentiate. And here, another extension of Jump helped make things very easy. And uh, default is that application where we can talk about differential optimization problems. All right, so to a few new stuff. So that was past, and this is something that I do at my current job with Pascal, and this one I'm gonna talk about. All right, so the setting is you have parametric optimization problems, meaning you solve many instances of very similar problems where they change just a handful or a subset of the coefficients of that problem, and you have to kind of keep solving that again. But Optimization problems can be very expensive. Can we learn um, a mapping from these changes in parameters to a function of the solutions, or uh, even uh, the, the set of solutions itself that we can use that later on as a replacement for the optimization given that we are solving very similar problems? Can we learn these repetitive um, uh, patterns? So we call this, or some people call this a proxy or a surrogate. 
and I'm gonna try to kind of convince a little bit of the usability of that um, in some cases. But you can think about if you wanna solve a problem very fast and, and you don't have time to solve the, the full optimization problem. And, but this is very similar to many of you and we have done that in the past where we learned a function of the solution which is just the objective function. And this is old news. Uh, we have done that very, a lot of people have done that already in stochastic programming where we try to learn the objective function of a dependent optimization problem and we use that to build uh, very efficient solution techniques. But that requires a few um, constraints on that optimization problem and the relationship between those optimization problems uh, for tractability, right? So cutting planes, everybody here knows about it. You have this master problem or upper level or first stage problem and you have to solve, you query other, another optimization problem which describes different scenarios of future consequences you have and as I said, you, for this to be able to actually make sense and, and to, for us to be able to solve this, our lower level or, or second stage problem needs to respect some, uh, some conditions and the relationship between them. Have. And even in those cases where you respect those things, this is very expensive. So if you have a sequential decision problem and you want to solve that um, very fast to control a robot or whatever, that could be very uh, difficult. And especially if you plan given certain scenarios, but then the information that you can use to actually pick those scenarios changes. All right, so the question is, which I'm gonna try to motivate later, can we replace that lower level problem, uh, that second stage problem with a proxy? Can we use that and then query that thing which is much faster than our optimization problem to kind of get the information we need to approximate that future cost function? Let's see if that's possible. All right, so re disregarding if we can actually approximate the solution or of the objective function of the optimization problem, what are the constraints that we need to uh, require out of our proxy model, let it be a neural network or whatever, that we can use then to create cuts and, and solve our um, upper level problem. So we need convexity and we can do that with putting some restrictions on our model. And in a neural network, that is the restrictions on the, on the coefficients. And if you do add these uh, restrictions, then you can change from a neural network that can represent any function, um, non-convex function, to functions, uh, to convex functions, right? All right, so if we can guarantee that the function represented by our proxy is convex, then we can use that back in cutting planes, for example. All right, but can these uh, restricted uh, uh, proxies, neural networks, um, actually approximate a non-convex problem or the optimum powerful problem, if you are familiar with it? So this was one of the questions we tried to solve, and the answer, yes. Um, so this non-convex problem, we were able to approximate with a convex uh, which you already know, people do that many times, but we could, it, we were able to do that very efficiently um, using uh, a little bit of modifications on the uh, black box solvers that we use to train neural networks. And we also, in the paper, which I'm gonna put the link after, we were able to prove some generalization guarantees and hopefully it's a new tool that you can use to solve um, complicated and larger optimization, dependent optimization problems. And here comes the fun part for people here, is that what I, I use the jump ecosystem, jump, poi, and flux to actually train that neural network. So um, L2O is the package, also very bad code, but it's a package. And you can go there and kind of kind of use the functionalities there to um, do some um, supervised training of your neural network and impose constraints that make your neural network convex. All right, so what if I do not want to only use my neural network to get cuts from it and solve an optimization problem? What if I want to represent the entire neural network in my um, jump optimization problem, right? So it's great. So what I did was I'm gonna just try it out and see where things break 
and where it did break was an activation function. So I only had to create an overload of that for um, jump, uh, jump um, types, and things just worked. So I was able to write my optimization problem, make things very easy, and then I could represent the entire um, convex neural network inside the optimization problem. But what if my neural network is not convex? All right, so you change a little bit, and you do another uh, dispatch, and then that works as well. So this was the amount of code that I needed to represent my entire neural network inside, and things just worked. And that's the beauty of multiple dispatch. All right, so this is the link to the paper. Um, I can give to people later, but this is the clear code. And it was a collaboration between the place that I work now at Georgia Tech and PSR and PUC EU. All right, so the thing that I'm most excited now about is um, what we are currently doing and how to use proxies to solve most state stochastic programming. So normally what people did uh, do is that they approximate the future cost function as we just talked about, and they, they try to approximate that and, and solve this complicated uh, optimization problem. But we came up with a new approach. What if we can use the um, ML model or proxy to directly predict or give a target to a few of the optimization variables, and in this case are the state variables, and perfect. So what we can do, and you can see that we remove the future cost, the, the part, the infinite part of our problem, the expected value, and now we can give that to the solver so that it only chooses the necessary variables for that stage. So with the linkage between the stages in a multi-state stochastic programming, now entirely handle by our proxy that represents a policy. All right, so you can do that, and then the, the way that we did that, you can build this, this problem in this way, and then you can loop back in and get information from that to train your optimization problem. We compared that with SDP, which is another way to solve multi-state stochastic programming, and great enough, we got great results, and for when the substages are non-convex and they don't respect all those constraints that you need to be actually be able to solve using SDP, we were able to beat SDP at that point. So what about control problems as well? So I made a stochastic version of the Goddard rocket problem that you have on the jump um, tutorials for a nonlinear. So this I took a little bit, as we say in Portuguese, uh, um, poetic license, so that this does not represent the most stochastic programming, but I just added these variables just so that we could see everything together. And we added some uncertainty to that problem, and then when you solve, great enough, uh, when you compare to um, MPC, model predictive control, we beat it. So that, that was very nice, and then that's thanks to Jump and the whole ecosystem that we could put things together, and that was it. So this is our recent paper that we talked about this. So my final words is that I was able to take advantage of the whole jump ecosystem and all those packages to actually be able to make the bridging and do everything that I've been do doing so far, bridging optimization and machine learning very much easy. So hopefully we can continue making this bridge between the different packages in jump and MOI and all these things. Um, to represent parameters, to be able to differentiate through them, and all these things, and make the life of everyone easier. Thank you. Okay, any question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about when you train your uh, uh, flux part. Or earlier problem. Um, I Not this one. The the first one. The first one before the first paper. Yeah. Uh, here. Yeah. How? Uh, where do you get your supervised training data for the uh, flux? Do you run the ex uh, like the function multiple times to get some data point, or do you just? Yeah, exactly that. So we we define this parametric optimization problem using Poi. And then we can uh, change the, the parameters of the optimization problem and save the solutions. And that's what we do with the recorder. So you record whatever you want, given 
primal do whatever you need from that optimization problem. And then you can save that data and use in your... Um, so so yeah. you like run it for like 100 times and then train the model and use that model from now on. Exactly. So, so this, this, uh, for this paper, we used only supervised learning. So that's what we did. We solved it 50,000 times and for different types of scenarios. And then we tried to learn from that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? So thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering about uh, when your problem changes structure. So for instance, if you are solving uh, 118 uh, IEEE and you change to 300 IEEE, do you have to train everything out again or can you leverage some of what you already know in the Flux network or somewhere else in order to not have to do another 50K iterations? That's a great question. And the reason is I retrain everything. Um, you do have, if your problem still has the same dimensions, then you can kind of try to reuse that information and I have had good uh, results on that. For example, I could uh, warm start the training for the AC OPF using whatever I did for this uh, uh, SOC uh, OPF. So you can, go and, and forget about a little bit of changes, but big changes like number of nodes, whatever, uh, I'm not quite sure how to do that, but perhaps there is a way. But I have, I think in, in my, op in my uh, the things that I've done, I had to do, retrain everything for each grid. Yeah, okay, last question. Question about the AC OPF problems. What are the advantages of your approach compared to nonlinear solver that can we directly solve the AC OPF problems, like so APOPT or, or MAN NLP, for example? So, so that's a great question. And um, so the results, I don't, I don't show the results here, but the comparison to see how accurate we are, right? Um, we get very uh, good results and with 0.5% uh, uh, error between the whatever we predict and the, the actual solution that comes from those nonlinear solvers. Okay. And the reason that we, we actually do this is because we want to make those so, uh, solutions faster. Right? But in terms of competition time, are you competitive? Or? Because it's great to have the same solution, but... Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I said you have, the, you have almost the same solution, but yeah. how long does it take to have this solution? Oh, um, uh, while in an optimization we actually take, I don't know, let's say that we take one minute, that would take milliseconds. Okay. The, the difference is okay, so that's very important. enormous. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.